Good evening, everybody. Good to see you. I hope everything's okay out in the Bay. I haven't been there in quite some time. I actually really haven't been anywhere in quite some time, nor have I imagined that you have either. Um, so good to be here. Um, so we're going to be following a theme for the next three weeks, starting tonight, uh, next Tuesday, and the following Tuesday. Um, so it's good that this is being recorded, I suspect, so that way... Um, People who miss them will be able to kind of follow along, but I'll try to tie them together so that way, if you if you miss one or see them one see see one or the other, it should somewhat make sense. And I would imagine these ideas are not that uh, foreign to you. These sila path factors. So, so really, we'll be talking about um, what they're classically known as: right speech, um, right action, and right livelihood. Um, and when you look to the Buddhist tradition for practical applications on really how to do these practices, we don't really find a lot. Um, you know, I don't, I've yet to come across a book that's specifically on Buddhist ethics, a book that's specifically on these three path factors. Now, probably 25 to 30 books every month come out on mindfulness. Um, and as a culture, as, as an American Buddhist culture, American Buddhist tradition, if we can use that word for for lack of a better word, I guess, uh, we have been very heavily focused on meditation, uh, my, mindfulness, uh, insight, vipassana. We are mostly um, preoccupied, not, not this isn't bad, but that's sort of the way that the teachings come down is we think we're going to meditate. And if we meditate, that's going to have some outcome that's going to be favorable, which is perfectly fine to think that. Um, so let me just give you a, a little bit of background about what Sila is, and I'll kind of zoom out and give you the 10,000 foot view if I can. Uh, Sila is, is one of the words for, for the Eightfold Path. There's three trainings, so we train in Sila, which is another way to say Sila in English would be, would be ethics, which isn't actually a great translation. Ethics, morality is even worse. Uh, but really, I think the word that does the heavy lifting here is integrity um, and having some kind of a commitment to your sense of values, your sense of personal ethics. So to some degree, it's fairly personal, I think. But really, is it, that's living in, within some integrity. Um, and, it's, and it's one of the path factors. So we, have, we train in ethics, we train in sila, we train in samadhi, which is meditation, which is uh, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. So much has been said about that. I don't need to really go there. Uh, and then we train in wisdom. Uh, which is, a, which is the path factors of intention and uh, right view, as they're traditionally called. Um, but so we're, we're very, very focused on uh, meditation, and we're very, very focused on wisdom, on understanding, not so much the ethics, actually. And if you look at the history of Buddhism in America, pretty short history, maybe 50, you could say 100 years, but there's not much if you go back far. The, the general history is that Buddhist leaders, many Buddhist leaders, tend to um, create harm, uh, tend to um, not really embody this quality of sila. If we look back, every tradition has their teachers and has their scandals and they have their problems that usually boil down to some kind of a lack of integrity. Uh, a lot of it is usually in the nature of sexuality uh, and also money sex and money in America, those are the two big, uh, that really incriminate the mind. Um, and so what, why is this? And why is this foundational practice uh, maybe not getting the attention that it, that it deserves and that is needed? So I'm going to try to unpack that in a big way here for you guys in the next couple of weeks. Um, Sila is understood as kind of the, the foundation of the practice. So if you were living in a Buddhist country and you grow up in a Dharma kind of informed world, you would learn uh, right out of the gate, you would learn Dana Sila Bhavana, the cultivation of generosity, the cultivation of goodwill, which are not that challenging practices to understand intellectually. It's not like Buddhist psychology or some of these esoteric ideas. It's like, be kind, be generous, be harmless as best you can, you know, start there. Um, and then the meditation and then the wisdom. So the wisdom actually comes at the end. So the wisdom that we're looking for in Dharma practice is a result of our behavior and a result of our understanding our minds. And when we integrate our behavior and we integrate our minds uh, and, and we get those things kind of working for us, 
um, we start to have wisdom, or you could say understanding. We start to understand just how to live better. We start to understand things like uh, that we're part of a shared humanity, that we're sort of all in this together. And we are. And boy, the world could use that right now, don't you think? Uh, we could use, we could definitely use a little bit of we're all in this together. So that's kind of a little bit of the setup. Um, but I do want to go um, back, back, back to the time of the Buddha. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit of a nerd and a scholar of early Buddhism. And early Buddhism is kind of a new emergence in the Buddhist world, which is kind of a looking at the teachings in the early canon. So um, the Pali canon, which is five some five thousand some odd pages which is largely associated with the theravada tradition although most people don't know the theravada tradition also uses a whole bunch of other texts things like the vasudhi maga for example the, the theravada is actually not that old theravada is not that much older than mahayana actually so when we say early buddhism we're saying we're going way 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 back and trying to capture what was going on in fifth century india who is this guy? Starts it out to Gautama. What was his world like? Um, and what was he up to? What was he really trying to? What was the message he was trying to convey? And when you do this, one thing you find, I think that's very important that I'm really interested in right now and really happy to share with you that's being uncovered by a lot of Buddhist teachers and, and people who study the early canon from a kind of academic and uh, historical perspective is that originally there were two Buddhist paths, there were two Dharma paths. Right. There was the Dharma path of the, the one that we all know about, the Dharma path of monasticism. Uh, in, in Buddhism, largely, very largely is a monastic tradition. And uh, and I and I and I don't I think that's great. I'm not anti monastic by any stretch. I'm pro Buddhist. I'm a Buddhist fanatic. I love this stuff. I love all of it. But I'm not a monastic. I live in a house with a mortgage. I got a couple of car payments. I got kids. I got health insurance. Sometimes I have health insurance. Sometimes I don't. I have all kinds of stuff that I have to deal with that I'm sure y'all have to deal with. So uh, when we're looking at the early tradition, we're seeing that the Buddha was offering a path of monasticism, which is, which, which is what turned into Buddhism. Buddhism is just a monastic Dharma practice. There was another Dharma practice that was for people, um, which they called this term, I don't like so much householders or lay people. I just use the term non-monastic because it really does the heavy lifting. I'm a non-monastic person. I'm not anti-monastic, I'm just non-monastic. And so uh, I wanna read this quote that comes from the canon, which kind of highlights this idea. He, the Buddha says here, there are not only 100 or 500 but far more men and women lay followers, my students, clothed in white, enjoying sensual pleasures, who carry out my instruction, respond to my advice, and have gone beyond doubt, free from confusion, and have gained skill, and have become independent of others in my teaching. What happened to those folks? So he's saying that, that at the time of the Buddha, there was actually a lot of people who were not monastics, who were practicing the Dharma, who were cultivating the Eightfold Path. And so I think there's a Dharma path in the canon that's actually long forgotten, which is starting, I think, to reemerge now because in Western society, I can't even say Western anymore, in modernity, I guess I would have to say, there's a lot of people who are not interested in a monastic life, who are very interested in cultivating a, pra a practice of Dharma. And probably most of you are with me on this. But when it comes to speech, action, and livelihood, when we look to the tradition, we don't find a lot. The, the, the monastics don't have much to say about it because they follow 227 tr precepts. They don't deal with a lot of the stuff that we deal with. So um, I want to really take a, a good look at these terms and these practices and go, what, what's really being said here? And the first thing that I want to do um, is retranslate the original, um, not actually retranslate, I actually give you the actual literal translation. So looking at the etymology. So if we just look at, so we'll start with right speech, which these whole, this whole right thing, first of all, let's just pause for a second. If you look at the Eightfold Path, every path factor starts with right. 
right view, right intention, right? And let me tell you, we're already in trouble when we're thinking in terms of right and wrong. We're already locked into a binary perspective, which we know binary is the, is the predictor for polarization, right, wrong, good, bad, left, right, blue, red. Are you familiar with these ideas? This is like, we, this has gotten us into a lot of trouble. We really need to start thinking beyond binary male, female, we could go on and on and on, right? There's so many binaries that we live by. Black, white, it just goes on and on and on. We live in a binary world, but we actually don't really live in a binary world. We live in a world of interdependent events, right? So we're trying to understand the complexity of the human experience a little bit more. So, um, well, so we can just take that word right and just politely put that aside. You don't even need it. If I say I'm gonna do a talk tonight on speech, you're going to assume you came to SF Dharma Collective that I'm going to talk about a Buddhist perspective on talking. I don't need to put right at the front of it, right? So let's just put that aside. So the word here is, the word for right is sama, which doesn't really mean right. It's hard to translate. It means more like complete or um, skillful, authentic. But the word vacha is the word I want to talk about. And this is the word that we translate as speech, sama vacha. Vacha doesn't really mean speech, but the Pali word vacha, sometimes people use the word communication, which is a little better than speech, actually means voice. So when we're looking at a Dharma perspective on communication or how we talk, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to find our voice. How many times have you been in a conversation with somebody where there was some conflict and confusion and you were kind of stumbling over your words and what were you trying to do in that moment? You were trying to find your voice. How do I want to say this? And we stumble over the semantics and we stumble over social conventions and we stumble through a lot of our language because we're not really in touch with our heart. We're not really in touch with our bodies. We're not really in touch with our sila. And so we, we, maybe we, we say something that's a little maybe dishonest or a little inauthentic or a little bit avoidant. And we, we, don't, we don't speak from our voice. We kind of speak from these really like disintegrated perspectives. And then, we, you know, have you ever walked away from a conversation feeling bad about how the conversation went because you didn't say what you wanted to say? Or you, didn't, or you weren't able to, to articulate what the point you were trying to get across because you were unable to find your voice. Now, I actually really, first of all, I, I, I'm, a, I'm also a big junkie for accuracy. I think uh, if you're going to teach early Buddhism, you really should do the homework because a lot of the stuff that we hear about, a lot of the translations are really pretty, um, pretty inaccurate. Um, it's like a really old game of telephone and we get stuck with some of these things. So to me, right speech just sounds like here comes the rules on how to be a good Buddhist right? Which I'm not interested in, frankly. But when I when I can think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, how do I find my voice in the world? And the first time I really stumbled across this idea, I was with a teacher who I've been working with for many years, who was kind of one of my favorite teachers named Stephen Batchelor. And I was uh, doing a retreat with him actually right before COVID happened at Upaya Zen Center. And I got to meet with him and we hadn't seen each other in maybe four or five years. And I got to meet with him for a couple hours and just kind of talk. And one of the first things he asked me, he said, how's your teaching going? I said, oh, it's going pretty good. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And he said to me, he said, have you found your voice as a teacher yet? And I was like, I was like, I actually have no idea what it means, but I really like that question. I really like that question. I'm like, have I found my voice? And, and, you know, and I was like, I think in many ways I have. But a lot of times, am I, am I teaching from my voice or am I teaching from what I learned or what I've read? Or am I just regurgitating the stuff that I read on the books behind me? You know, which I did that for many years because, I, you know, it takes a long time to find your voice. The other way to think about this is if you ever go take a writing class, if there's any writers out there, if you take a writing class or a writer's workshop, the teacher, one of the first things they'll ask you to do is to find your voice. Finding your voice as a writer, finding your voice as an author. If you work in music, if you're a musician or a singer, they ask you to find your voice in many ways, not just finding the singing tonality of your voice, but finding your voice in a Bob Dylan sense of, are you able to articulate through words what you're, the meaning of what you're trying to do? 
poets find their voice musicians find their voice artists find their voice therapists find their voice we all need to find our voice right and so uh i think when you think about this in a broader sense at least for me this was my experience when i started to think about it in this way uh the practice of right speech became a lot more dynamic became a lot more interesting um one of my punk rock friends back in Boston used to always say, can you say what you mean without being mean when you say it? And let me tell you, not so easy. So we want to try to um, think about this as a kind of, um, as a practice, as, some, as a practice that you maybe actually probably to some degree will never finish. You know, we're always kind of going through these experiences where we, and probably there's people in your life, I would argue, maybe maybe people in your family, maybe your partners, maybe close friends, that when you hang out with certain people, you've, you've actually found your voice in that relationship. Are there people that you hang out with regularly that you can speak openly and freely and speak from your body? I'm sure you have a handful of those folks. And that's really what metta is about, loving kindness. Uh, is, you know, Kalyana Mita, a good friend, is we, we do it, and that's where we really get to practice, I think, this Samavacha, or this finding our voice, uh, is where we get to practice it the best, is when we're, we're, when we're with people where it's not super complicated what we say. We can kind of put our filters aside, um, and we can kind of, you know, say what we mean a little bit more. And so, of course, we want to kind of go, well, so what is the, um, so it's not just about finding your voice. It's also, a, it's a seal of practice. So it's trying to find a voice that is rooted in harmlessness. Can I not be so harmful with my words? Uh, so if you look at the standard, you know, teaching, uh, there's usually, some people call them the four gates, but the first one is, can we be uh, more honest? in our speech. Or I would say for me, honesty is kind of a slippery slope sometimes. I think that maybe the better word is actually transparent. Can I be more transparent in how I present myself to people? More honest. Um, and just kind of not doing that as a hard rule. It's like, okay, no more lying ever again, you know, like, but more like just watching when you're talking, like, am I being honest? Am I being honest? Or, um, you know, and, 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 and honesty is not just like, you know, lying about some frivolous bullshit, right? That's part of it. Part of it is like, um, actually, uh, you know, someone asks you how you're doing and you're actually not doing really well. You're struggling about something. You're freaked out about something. And someone says, how are you? And you say, oh, I'm, 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 I'm good. It's a different kind of lying, but it's like, there's, you're not stepping into your voice. There's not an authenticity in there. There's kind of a withholding. Now, of course, in some situations, that's, appropriate to do but it's complicated it's complicated you know if you now if you add emailing and text to this conversation it gets even more complicated because that's part of our communication device too so there, there's that is, is what am i saying is it true is it honest am i being truthful in my speech um then we look at am i am i being kind uh or am i being non-divisive um non-blaming non so you know what does kindness look like you know, it, well, it looks like a lot of things, but it's, you know, not being divisive. The two ones that I watch my, and myself all the time, the hardest is like, you know, if I'm in some sort of pain or distress, my tendency is to blame or to be defensive. And, you know, that's not that kind. I don't know if you've been around somebody who's in, you know, we get around people, we get in these blaming, we get in these kind of modes of communication that's like not very kind. It's not pleasant to be around. So trying to be more um, cooperative, more um, really trying to just kind of express what's going on without trying to find fault. Taking and a lot of it is taking responsibility, which is something that we don't always want to do. You know, I have a, I have a nine year old son downstairs who sometimes will call me on things. I'll you know I'll say something or I'll do something that he doesn't like or. And he'll call me on it. And then, of course, my, my tendency is, is to be defensive because I'm the adult, I'm the father. Like, you know, like, you're nine years old. You can't correct me, right? You know, like, or that quick reflex. And it's like, well, wait a minute. He's actually totally right. 
you know, I am being grumpy and short and kind of, you know, he's right, actually. So there's, there's an accountability thing here that's really, really hard putting that defensiveness aside. The other one I think that's interesting and also very tricky um, is this timely. Is this the right time to have this conversation? Have you ever been forced into a conversation that you didn't want to have and it didn't go well? Or have you ever tried to force somebody else into a conversation they didn't want to have and it didn't go so well? It wasn't necessarily the right time. Um, and then the, uh, the other fourth one that we see is, is, is what am I saying? Is it useful? Right? And it's not like you have to be very, very careful. I really want to try to break you from this idea of like, these are the rules on how you should talk if you're a good Buddhist. These are just practices. These are just things to kind of, the Buddha's just trying to help us. He's like, hey, just notice when you're talking, if you're telling the truth. Notice if you're being kind or not. Notice if this is the right time to have this. Notice if this is helpful. Is this, is this, is this adding to the, you know, the something they say in Zen? Is this, is this an improvement from the silence? Now, if you reflect on that, you probably won't talk as much, right? You're like, does this improve upon the silence? And a lot of times it doesn't. A lot of times we just chit chat the past time. And a lot of the frivolous chit chat and kind of stuff we engage in is kind of, um, you know, especially in the English culture, and, and I'm from Boston, so I'm guilty as the day is long. A lot of it, we kind of engage in this cynical, sarcastic, kind of shit talking banter. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if you find yourself doing this, but I do, especially right now. I see people do it all the time. And it's like, I feel like it's almost like this social, emotional junk food where it's like, you know, we're just kind of engaging in this banter. It's not really skillful. It's not really helpful. It's pleasant kind of, but not really. It's what the Buddha calls the honey tipped arrow. And a lot of times when we talk, it's like that honey tipped arrow. Have you ever said something to somebody that was maybe a little bit mean or a little bit underhanded or a little bit blamey? Or a little bit judgy and when you first got the words out you got that little hit of honey on the tip of the arrow and then immediately it was followed by a ouch i love that analogy of a honey tipped arrow right because it's like it, at first and of course you can't you know you know this karmically right like you can't unsay you can you can you can say i was just kidding and i apologize and i regret it but it's like you can't put the genie back in the bottle if any of you are married or partners right now, this is something that happens in my life where it's just like, and a lot of times the people that we're closest to get the worst of it, you know, which is just kind of really sad, actually, if you think about it. So trying to um, see this voice as a kind of a guideline, and this is about all you'll get. If you look at the teachings on right speech and the canon or even the Bika Bodhi Eightfold Path, basically you get these four, which they're good, but they're so not enough. Right, they just kind of basically are the tip of the iceberg. The last one that I would add um, that I think is important, and it's a word that's kind of been watered down in our society, but I have to use it anyway because it's a good word, is am I being authentic in my communication? Because sometimes, and this happens in sort of nice Buddhist communities, you might notice, it's like, yes, I'm being kind, yes, I'm being honest, yes, I'm being all those things, but I'm actually not being very authentic. You know what I mean? I'm just sort of being a good Buddhist right now. You know, or, 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 and, and, and sometimes you can be in that contrived space sometimes with people where it feels a little in, inauthentic. You know, I, I got this growing, because I grew up at Buddhist centers a lot when I was a teenager because I've been around this practice for so long. But like, and I love these places. I'm not trying to say anything negative about them. But like, you know, your IMSs or your spirit rocks, sort of your typical white affluent kind of nice white people, Buddha centers. And you find a lot of this kind of uh, light hearted, but nobody's really willing to talk about what's really going on. You know, it's like not polite to talk about your suffering or talk about these kinds of things. And it's kind of very surface, but it's, you know, it's, it's all on, it all hits all the marks. It's the right time. It's useful, it's, but it's not really authentic. And that's one thing I miss about, I think probably some of you probably miss as well, cause you've been around for a while. This is what I miss about the against the stream community is there was definitely 
a permission to be a little bit more authentic with how we communicated. Um, and that was, I think that was a big loss for everybody. I think you guys had it too at the SF Dharma Center because you guys kind of took that space over. But now nobody has a space anymore because we can't meet in public. Can't meet in public. So, you know, one of the downsides of the pandemic. Um, so I do want to do some practice around this because um, I think it's important. And then I'll, then I'll, I'll, after we do a practice, I'll talk a little bit more about the other two path factors because it's, uh, I also want to give you a framework for those. And then the next week, we'll kind of go through them again. The following week, go through them again. So we can see these are really uh, essential practices. I mean, how much of your day is in communication or talking or texting or emailing with somebody else? And if you get into not see that or to not to include that or not to fully acknowledge that that is part of your Dharma practice, then we miss all this opportunity. We miss all this opportunity because I think also there's an, there's an implicit understanding. The other thing I don't like about Sila, the way it's kind of, acknowledged in um, American Buddhism, for lack of a better word. Um, well, I'm glad you guys do. I'm seeing this chat come up. Um, I'm glad that you do. You're lucky. And is that, is that there's, there's actually an in, in implication being made that there's sort of an assumption made that because we're in this space that we've all that we're already already all doing this seal of thing. You know, that you just, just because you're on the screen or just because somebody walks into the center or just becomes somebody sitting on the retreat, there is a lot of assumptions that the seal is sort of implied. Um, so it's not really at the forefront of the conversation. I mean, even if you go to Dharma Seed, which is like 500,000 Dharma talks, you know, it's like search seal or search these things I'm talking about and you won't get much, not much will come up. I think because people are maybe hesitant to go there or try to, um, unpack it a little bit further. So, um, and I'll talk more about when I, uh, after the practice about secular and what I mean by that word, because I get a lot of pushback for that word. But I do want to do a guided practice with you, one that I suspect that you've never done. Um, and so uh, it's a Brahma, it's, so it's, uh, my, my teacher, Stephen Smith, talks about, and the Burmese talk about this, uh, uh, Sila, uh, Sila Brahma Vihara. Sila Brahma Vihara, which is um, now before you even start talking, you're doing this other thing that I'm sure you're familiar with called thinking. Now, thinking is just you talking to you in your own head, basically, right? I mean, isn't that what thinking is? It's just a conversation I'm having with myself in any given moment. Sometimes it's not a conversation. Much of the time, it's an argument. You know, my self comes in and says, you know, Dave, I got a whole bunch of things I don't think you're doing right. And I, there's some things that you need some work on. There's some things that you need to do be do better. So when we think about Sila Brahma Vihara, we really want to try to understand that this all begins. And this is a meditation practice. This all begins by addressing the internal narrative that we hold, that we have. And remembering that the whole practice begins with us trying to develop an internal narrative that is sila, that is kind, that is useful, that is timely, that is honest. A lot of my thoughts don't fall into one of those. Some of my thoughts are total lies. I'll be honest. My mind lies to me all the time. It's giving me information at the times when I don't particularly need it. And so a lot of, I think we have to understand, and this is why people sometimes don't like it, but when you do Brahma Vihara practice in, in, in standard Theravada, we use phrases, right? May I be at ease, may I be happy, may I learn to care about the stuff. We use these phrases for very, very specific reasons because we're actually trying to install, we're trying to grab the stream of thoughts and push it in a better direction. So they're not mantras, they're not aspirations. They're, they, they've gotten really watered down, which I, think is a, which I think is actually tragic. But really what it is, it's trying to train the heart and mind to say, hey, hey, we're good here, you and me. Come on, enough, 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 enough is enough already. 
you know, it's really about cooperation. It's about kindness. It's about compassion. And so uh, when we do a guided sealer practice or this kind of, so you want to find, and I'm sure you've already found it, you want to find, but you also want to cultivate and you want to bring it, bring into full fruition, your, your inner voice that's rooted in goodness, that's rooted in sila, and, and, and have that as part of your mode of operating. And, you know, I find it odd that we don't hear this teaching as much as we maybe should. Because typically what happens is we we're so mindfulness focused and concentration focused that the general message that many of us get is that if I'm thinking while I'm meditating, then I'm like not meditating right. Not only are my thoughts often unkind and judgmental, but the fact that I'm having thoughts at all is a problem. Have you gotten this message from time to time? I don't know where that came from, but let me tell you, I struggled with it for years. So we'll do a practice for maybe about 25 minutes or so, and, I, and, and we'll do this. This will be the practice to try to find the seal of voice. And so I'll walk you through it and leave plenty of space, and we can, we can talk about it some at the end. So you can just find a comfortable way to sit. And so just allowing yourself to disengage from the thoughts and just let your awareness really come into the body. Pouring the mind into the body. And to just cultivate a very simple mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of the body. Really feeling into the warmth, the coolness of the body, rising, falling with the in and out breath. Releasing any tension or tightness. Just cultivating this simple awareness, present time experience.
and then allowing your attention to begin to rest at the area at and around your heart center. And just seeing if you can release any tension or tightness in the area from the chin down to the belly button. So releasing any tension or tightness in the neck or throat. Softening the belly. And just allowing yourself to experience the rise and fall of the in and out breath. And then as you feel into the chest, the heart center area, just see if you could begin to recognize or to acknowledge in any way your own wish, desire to be free. It's your own simple wish or desire to be free, to be at ease, to be content, safe, whatever it is for you. If you can just continue to recognize, uncover any sense of innate goodness in the body and the heart. And then it's beginning to find voice, words for that well-wishing. May I be at ease. May I be peaceful. May I be content in this moment just as it is. Just continuing to come back into this embodied experience of sitting and breathing. And to recognize any sense of harmlessness, of goodness, an intention of well-wishing.
And this practice really begins and starts to cultivate when we can just recognize, even if it's the smallest amount of a desire, of a wish, of a hope even. To bring to ourselves this internal narrative, this internal reminder of goodness to be good to ourselves, to be honest with ourselves, to be kind with ourselves, to be useful and beneficial to ourselves, helpful. And to not allow the mind to engage in frivolous, harmful distractions. So if you're able to access this sense, this inner sense in the body and the heart, just let that be the anchor. Continue to remind yourself to recollect, to bring mindfulness towards this subtle and simple movement of heart and behavior. This internal Dharma voice that may not even have words yet or language, but that can recognize just even the most subtle, simple sense of possibility of change transformation And as you continue to practice in this way, you'll find, I'm sure, that there will be distracting thoughts arising, concerns and worries about ourselves, the world. We can just recognize those and let those go. 
Now is not the time to engage. So in this sila integrity for ourselves, we just allow ourselves to unhook and to be free from these tendencies to proliferate into the past, into the future, to our concerns about the world. And as you practice in this way, you can begin to even inquire for your own, what is the voice that is most needed right now? The voice of acceptance, having acceptance for ourselves, of kindness, of compassion, the voice of care. If something in your life is difficult and challenging now, today, May I learn to care about myself. The voice of gratitude, of appreciation. The voice of equanimity, the voice of just understanding. Understanding what's true and useful right here and now. And perhaps even just a voice of silence is all that's required. And this voice of Sila is the voice of harmlessness, the voice of kindness, the voice of acceptance. the voice of goodwill, of well-wishing, this Sila Brahma Vihara heart.
See if you can just allow yourself to rest in that space. And whatever that space you find yourself in, that space of goodwill. Just holding that in silence for the last five minutes of the practice. All right, thank you very much for your practice this evening. 
So before I carry on, I always like to um, find that the best questions in conversation about meditation usually happen right after the practice. So um, anybody have any experiences, thoughts, questions, maybe haven't done a practice like that? It's not your common practice, but I think it's a, I think it's important that we can understand that sila can, in fact, actually be a guided practice. Yeah, please, Jenny. The practice was beautiful, but I, and I kept coming back to um, your translations. I I was so taken by Lacha as voice that I lost Sama. What did you say about sure? Sama is kind of not that important. So Sama, if you look at the path factor, Sama is the word at the beginning of all eight. And it's mm -hmm. what's usually translated as right, mm -hmm. right view, right intention, right speech. So, you know, it's it, it, in both Pali scholars, it's kind of impossible word, word to translate. I've even told with the idea of using different ones to make it more appropriate. It means something more like complete. Mm -hmm. okay. So complete meaning like, like I've completed the task. Like I now have, like it works good for right view, not right view, but complete view. Mm -hmm. Can I, can, can I see the whole picture? So it's really about a task base. So, you know, samavacha would mean that I, I've completely developed an authentic voice that I feel comfortable and confident every time I talk. It's like, well, you're probably never going to complete any of this stuff. But I think that we, it, you know, so I, I don't think we need that so much. And, and, I, and I find that it's problematic because it's been so bogged down in this idea of right or mm -hmm. correct. And I just, you know, right and wrong is like one of the biggest troublemaker ideas in the world. I think we just need to get away from that. It's not very, it's pretty naive to think of things in terms of right and wrong. Yeah, Claudia, please. Uh, I was looking at all your um, different um, adjectives, if you want, to describe uh, how our voice should be honest, kind, um, authentic. And I was really struggling in that, how can I say, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I, just recently something happened with a sister of mine who has a lot of issues, okay? And I try to be kind and uh, honest, but at the same time, um, pointing out that she need to do some inner work, essentially. Sure. And I think it's really hard. I think it's hard when people also have baggage yeah. and can really misconstrue or misinterpret because we all know, I mean, I mean, I have my own baggage and I have, it, it's happened to me that I have had, for lack of a better word, a wrong perception of something because is triggering something from my background oh, yeah, and yeah. I am interpreting it in a certain way. And even though I try to be kind, trying to understand where she's coming from and honest and authentic, but sometimes the person is not quite ready to receive it or, yeah. to, or to understand it. So I may have the best intention, yeah. but it may not always be interpreted the way I mean it. Yeah. And, I, and I love what you say about like, can you say what you mean without being mean when you say it? I mean, I think it's Ooh. so <laughs> pretty important, you know? I mean, it's the yeah. tone of your voice. And it was precisely my sister said that the tone of my voice of what I said, and I said, you know, you are deeply hurt. I mean, I understand where you're coming from and you are misinterpreting or, or you're having the 
wrong perception of what I'm trying to say. So it's so hard, Dave, because oh my I mean, God, it's so hard. You know, you can have the best. I mean, part of it, I think the hard part is like letting it be hard. Because hmm. there's also this kind of delusion we get in Buddhism that if you did that thing with your sister correctly, it would have, none of this guarantees that it's going to be a good outcome. That's not being guaranteed here. Right, right. So a lot of this is risky. And, but what the other risk happens is like, is a lot of times we'll be conflict avoidant. We won't be truthful. We won't be, we won't tell our sister the hard facts that she needs to hear because we don't want that conflict. That's not great either. Right. You know, so sometimes being authentic and also there's intention versus impact. Like Mm -hmm. I might have all these intentions, but the impact that that has on you, I don't get to choose the impact that that has. You know, this it's risky. Human relationships are risky. They're messy. And part of finding our voice is even like tone of voice Mm -hmm. is part of that. Mm -hmm. And how am I feeling when I'm saying it? And so it, it's really, really hard. But the thing I think that, that does the heavy lifting for me is if I try to remember as much as I can that this is a practice and it's part of my practice. Hmm. And I pay attention in a kind of different way when I'm talking to people, especially about big ticket items, right? Like if I'm talking to my dad about, you know, how we're going to plant some trees and water him, I don't have to be that, you know, skillful or whatever but uh-huh. you know there's certain there's, there's, there's different kinds of conversations and i think we need to be clear about what kinds of like being collect if i have to have a conversation with somebody that i know is going to be hard i go into that conversation well prepared mm-hmm. i'm like i know this is gonna be hard and you know i want to be careful and, and there's no guarantee right you know and so I think part of this practice of finding our voice is actually a willingness to be, to take risks. Hmm. Like you took a risk with your sister, didn't you? I bet you weren't comfortable going into it. You thought maybe this isn't going to go well. Maybe I shouldn't. And I think that we, uh, we owe it to ourselves to take these kinds of risks. So we don't just fall into kind of placating or reassuring or pretending. Right. Yeah, I mean, I even offer some resources and, and now whatever she does with that or she does or not, it's yeah. up to her, right? But uh, And the story's yeah. not over yet. Who knows how this is going to end? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Thank you. You know, some of the most important things that, that ever happened to me in my life, and I thank some of my teachers for this, is like some of the things that were most helpful to me and transformative in my life were things that people told me about myself that were initially really hard to hear. Like really hard to hear. And I'm so glad they said, I'm so glad they told me. I'm so glad they were willing to do something risky and say, you know, Dave, I got to tell you, you know, and, and, you know, and it'd be hard for them to say and and hard for me to hear it and being able to have enough of a practice and enough of a a reflective ability to sit with them and go, gee, you know, they're, they're, they're," you know, and so we, we really have to do that. You know, we need to do this for each other. And it's, you know, this is a, this, this makes it a whole different, a whole different playing field, doesn't it? Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, Suzanne, please. Yeah. um, Thank you, Dave. And no, I've never done quite that type of a a pravahara um, around the sila. And that was, what was really interesting to me is something I, okay, I struggle with speech, right or otherwise. Who doesn't? Um, like, yeah, I guess I, I, I just feel like I fall short in so many ways. And I've always thought about the speech as what I'm, what I'm putting out, what, how I'm speaking to others or of others, or what I'm saying in terms of its timeliness, truth, authenticity. But I have never, to, to my knowledge, thought about doing I thought about it in terms of the way that I speak to myself that's where it all begins though doesn't it yeah and especially and including when I'm in meditation because that's one of the biggest parts of my um distraction is not only thinking you know getting up you know like getting off track yeah sure I get off track and I can be nice to myself about like okay you know focus back in I can do that but 
I do get where I get off track a lot is thinking about, oh, I said this, I did this, I did, I said this, I said to this, this person, I said it wrong. I shouldn't have said anything. I shouldn't. And it's, it's all, it, I'm talking to myself about my speech in the most unforgiving way possible. I hear as you. though like that's one area that I should have complete and utter control over. And, and then, you know, I, and I give myself the hardest time about it. And and in doing that, I'm not really speaking well to myself, am I? And so right. this is something that I, I just, that just came up. It just suddenly occurred to me as this insight while I was doing it. I'm like, oh, wow, you're, you're thinking about your speech and you're, that in and of itself is causing me to speak poorly of myself and be really unforgiving in a way that I don't think I'd be towards somebody else this misstep. So yeah, I, I learned, I, yeah, no, I hear you. I learned this really great trick from this guy named Rami Shapiro. When I lived in Nashville, this guy, Rami Shapiro is like this Jewish rabbi. Who's like this guy who's a recovery advocate. He's this totally amazing dude. And his whole thing about spirituality and his whole thing about all this work is like, the goal is to just keep the conversation going. Like, but, but, but have it be a conversation, not an argument, not a blame fest, not a, just like, you know, like, let's just keep talking, you know, okay, like, this is really hard right now. And I get it. Let's, let's just keep, let's just keep talking through this. And a lot of times I feel like that's the relationship I have with myself is an ongoing conversation. The relationship I have with the Dharma is actually an ongoing conversation where I'm constantly looking and, and it's actually really the thing about it that's so interesting is what it what that is 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 taking a contemplative perspective on everything let you know you know like let, let's just stay in this let's just see let's see where this goes like with your sister right keep the conversation going it's not over yet you know maybe at the point at this point in the episode it's you know it's a tense moment but we have to kind of think beyond the limitations of what's happening in the present moment and try to just say okay like i mean we have to keep going anyway you're going to keep going anyway. You know, you might as well try to keep that kind of conversation. And in that conversation, it's the spirit of cooperation, of willingness to be, you know, I'm, you know, maybe, maybe I don't like you right now. And maybe I'm really upset with you right now. And I feel hurt by you right now. And maybe all that's true, but let's keep, I'm still willing to stay in the conversation. And I've used that, I can't tell you how many times I've used that. I've used that in relationship with people where I'm like, I feel like my friendship is over here. Or I feel like this part of my life is over. I'm willing to stay in the conversation, even though I think it's over. And, you know, that's, that, that's another a very, you know, in, in the language of Eve Ekwin and kind of the CEB work around destructive and constructive. That's sort of the, the nature of what makes things constructive is a willingness for further collaboration and further cooperation, even though I think we might be done here. And, you know, and that's, that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty advanced skill for a human being to take into difficult scenarios. You know, look at our culture, our culture right now, we're so polarized, right? I'm right. You're wrong. And we're fucking done here. Where do you go from there? That is that is like the definition of destructive. And you're just obviously an idiot. And I'm obviously smarter than you. It's like, it's contempt, right? It's like, you know, it, it's the most destructive paradigm in the human condition. So, you know, part of it is like, can we just hang in there for each other just a little bit longer? Oh, it's so hard. I know it's so, it's so easy for, I'm, let me just say this. It's so easy for me to say this, right? Like this is easy to say. No way am I trying to say that this is what I do. This is what I, this is what I'm, this is the bar though. Like this is what I'm, this is what I'm, this is, I like this for the bar, you know? And it goes a variety of ways, you know? And you probably do it a lot more than you, the other thing, you probably do it a lot more than you think that you do, but you need to start being mindful. You need to start paying attention to like, to notice when you're in your voice and to just like be in them, be in them and be like, oh, I'm really connecting with this person. I'm really being honest. To notice it when it's happening and notice how good it feels. Both on the giving and the receiving, which is why we like to go out for coffee with friends, right? Because it's so pleasant and, and agree, you know, like that's why we like it. We like it because of everything I'm saying. 
Thank you, everybody. We have a little bit of time left. Does anybody have any, any other questions or reflections before I kind of back up a little bit? Yeah, Amy, go ahead. Real quick. Thanks, Dave. Um, I love that practice and what you said too about it being a practice and not the rules because I used to use that kind of stuff just to beat the shit out of myself. Oh, if man, I the Buddha, doing see, it. come out with the Buddhist rule list and we're all done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it seemed a lot softer and, um, and just a, a, like a really good practice for me because I'm also going through like a really sticky situation with a family member who... Uh, who isn't, man? Whew, and this one's, I just found out, is in stage four cancer and I haven't talked to her in a couple of years. And it's Ouch. just, yeah. And so uh, there's a lot of discomfort with like not wanting to talk to her. She's a very toxic person. And so, um, but, you know, they're very long backstory to it, but it's really, it's not my personality to do that generally, but I don't want that in my life. And, um, and so it's weird for me to sit with, it's hard for me to sit with that discomfort of not wanting to talk to her, not wanting to like, there'd be no smoothing anything over anyway, you know, and, um, and just to be at ease with that. And like, it's okay. It's, it's really my truth. Like if I'm being really authentic about it, like. You know, I, I feel sad for her and compassion and some gratitude for things that um, the relationship I had with her as a child, but not as an adult, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and but it's so uncomfortable. Yeah. So this was a really helpful practice. No, I'm sorry that. to hear that. Those, those, those situations are so hard when you just can't see beyond, you know, you're like, this is just how it is. And this is, you know, and part of it is not forcing yourself to have a conversation you're not willing or ready to have. And letting that be part of your inner voice of like, yeah, this is, this feels about where I'm at. And, and so, you know, it's, it's okay. That's okay too. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also her wishes too, you yeah. know? So yeah. it's, it's like, yeah. yeah. You know, this used to happen to me a lot. Yeah. Cause I used to, I used to be, um, I've been in a lot of bands and I've ended a lot of bands and I've ended a few bands that were successful bands. And as a result of me ending those bands, people were unhappy. So, um, I've been, um, people have told me to go fuck myself quite a few times. And, uh, and when people ask me, Hey, have you talked to so-and-so? I'm like, no, they told me this and now I'm just respecting their wishes. <laughs> yeah. You know, so part of it is like that too. It's like, I'm just, you know, if that's what you want, then I, I can respect that, you know? And, and, and so it's, it's a really boy. And this is like one path factor, right? There should be a million books on this. And so, um, yeah, that's what I want to end with. Cause we, we have a, a, about 10 minutes left or so. Um, yeah. is there, was there any other questions before I move on? Is... I guess I, I was just thinking about somebody else. And if, if I, it takes two to tango, but if, you, if, if I was authentic and I expressed how I really felt and that other person is not really willing to have that conversation. And yet it's still kind of like trying to, without really facing authentically, you know, what I'm trying to address. And I'm just trying to keep things going as if nothing has happened. Yeah, that's tough. It's kind of uncomfortable to accept that really superficial, unauthentic BS. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, I would say that it's a matter, not a matter of no, it's just maybe not yet, maybe not yet ready for that, you know, and, you know, and maybe not yet ever, you know, it's, it's hard. You know, this is one thing I noticed too about the Dharma path that it gets hard is that, you know, the, the, the long, the long, the older you get and the longer you practice and the more you do this work, the road gets kind of more narrow. There's less mm. travelers further on down the trail. You yeah. know, and we lose people along the way, and and, and you know, and that's sad. It takes a little carriage. It takes it a little. But one carriage. thing I've noticed that I will say that I that I'm actually really grateful for and happy to report is that the quantity of people in my life decreases, but the quality of people in my life really increases. 
you know, and I'd rather be super, super tight with like 10 people than like have like 80 acquaintances that I'm just kind of like chit chatting with. So that that's that's the nature of, 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 of Sangha, that. you know, you know, it, you know, that's why there's only six of us here. This isn't a popularity contest, right? You know, it's like it's just like, you know, we, we show up and we and we and we, you know, we do what we do and that's that's OK. And it's like, um you know, and sometimes that's the best thing of all, right? It's like a, that, that small, intimate space. So I do want to back up a little bit, though, in, in the last few minutes and say something I, I should have said at the beginning, but I didn't want to go down the road too far. And that is, um, I put it in the title, and I'm kind of coming a little bit more out of the closet around it, around this idea of secularity, um, secular dharma. I have a, me and my wife have an organization called the Secular Dharma Foundation. And so what I what I sort of mean by that is, first of all, secular is a grossly misunderstood term. People usually think secular means like anti-religion or these kinds of things. But secular is really, um, the word really just means right now. The, the secular world is the world in which we are living right now, which is 2021 pandemic, crazy, polarized culture. This is the secular world that we live in. We don't live in ancient India. We don't live in these other places. We don't live in 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th century Tibet. We live in this world. And so secular is a kind of an acclimating to the world in which we live. And secular, actually, there's really three criteria that make things secular. And, and, and a lot of it is ethics, is sila, is that the first understanding in, in the understanding of secularism is that what we, we whatever it is that we're doing, we want to improve the quality of life for everybody on the planet. That's a very secular perspective, socially, racially, sexually, all of this stuff is we really want to get beyond that. And we, the goal of secular thinking, secular thought, secular humanism is to create a better world for everybody. Um, the other thinking that I really adhere to, and I'm, I'm not an educated person by any stretch, is that if we're going to believe anything, if we're gonna put stock in any ideas, we should be putting stock in science. Science, mathematics are trustworthy, which is to push back for me against sort of the esoteric mystical side of Buddhism, which Buddhism makes lots and lots of mystical metaphysical claims that I'm actually not denying. I'm just saying, I don't really know. Uh, but science seems to know quite a lot and I'm gonna go with that. So there's an understanding that in, in secular dharma that we're, we're, we're not only are we going with that, but we're also taking science in, in, in for me therapy and counseling and, and all this stuff and bringing it into my dharma practice because, you know, the, the modern, modern world is full of great therapeutic self-help, uh, emotional, traumatic healing that we would be foolish to not use that stuff. So a lot, and, and so a lot of the reason I bring this up is because when it comes to speech, action, livelihood, you know, like for a monastic person, right livelihood is a useless teaching because they're monks; they're already doing the right livelihood. So this is why my I believe for sure there's two dharma paths. If the Buddha believed that the dharma was a practice for monastics, the teachings on right livelihood would be irrelevant. He would have never had to put them in there. I think the Buddha was brilliant, and I think he was concerned that over time this would become a, a monastic religious tradition, which is what he was always pushing against, frankly. And he said, let me put this in here so that way two, three thousand years down the road, somebody like Dave Smith can say, hey, what's up with this? If being if this is a monastic tradition and right lively, then there would be no, then why is that in there? And so the word, the, the, the word that they use in early Buddhism is, is artisans, an artisan, you know, a potter, a baker, a farmer. So that there, there's an, he's always using analogies to artisanship. So you, we all have our skills, which is what we'll talk about. Um, oh, and the last one, uh, the other criteria of secular is, you know, A, uh, it, it's, the goal is to improve the quality of life for everybody. If we're going to go with anything, let's go with science. And also this thing that's very rooted in Sila, it's good to do good to create positive change. And so doing good is actually really, really good and to buy into that idea. 
And so when we look at the next path factor, which we'll look at next week, going from speech is actually, we see this other really, probably the worst translated word of all here is uh, the term for right action. We hear right action. Um, well, the term is sama kamanta. Now, kamanta doesn't mean action. Actually, you know what means action, kama, karma means action. So it should be, it should say sama kama, but it doesn't, kamanta. Now, if you look in the Pali English dictionary and you start digging into these words, which I think is interesting that nobody decided to do, uh, kamanta means actually like work or labor or artisanship or, you know, what kind of, how am I uh, being in the world? Usually we think about that as livelihood though, don't we? But so really what I'm trying to say, what we're trying to understand now is sama kamanta, right? It's not right action. It's what is your work? And it's not what you do for a job. And, and, and this is why I love the therapeutic world so much is because when you go to therapy and you start working with people who are trying to do their work, because you know what happens, and Claudia, you'll appreciate this statement. When I don't do my work, I become work for everybody else. That's a La Mirad Owens quote. I love, I love me some La Mirad. And um, that's right, isn't it? When I don't do my work, I become work for everybody else. So when we look at Sama Kamanta as a path factor, is am I doing my work? And my work and your work and all, we all probably have very different work. There's probably some universal overlaps. I'm sure we're all probably trying to work on our childhood on some level, right? Like everybody's doing that kind of work, but we wanna actually have a sense of what our work is. Sama Kamanta means like work or labor or, you know, uh, when I get out, like, why do I get out of bed in the morning? You know, part of my work is to be a father. Part of my work is to be a husband. Part of my work is to be a son. Part of my work is to be a person who's trying to create positive change in the world. That's why part of my work is why I moved out to Colorado and I have chickens and I grow fruit trees. Part of my work is to try to have a less of a carbon footprint. I could go on and on and on. And I, and I suspect you could as well. So when we, when we think of our work as what we do for money, we are really, really robbing ourselves of a tremendous opportunity for this as a Dharma practice. Now, just to fast forward a little bit, the next path factor, livelihood. Now, usually everything I'm saying, you would think of this as right livelihood. But Sama Avija, Avija doesn't mean livelihood, really. It means for life. And really in the, in the secular world that we live in, what I do for life is what I do to, so really the teaching should be survival. How do I survive? How do I make sure my kids are fed? How do I pay my car insurance? How do I pay my mortgage? How do I put food on the table? And can I do that ethically in this culture? So a lot of it has to do with money and survival. And if I think my right livelihood is just about, you know, if my work is just about what I do for money, because a lot of times our work, so we have to see these as separate. My work as a father, as a husband, as a son, as a Dharma teacher, as a clinician, most of my work, I don't get paid for that shit. You know what I mean? In fact, a lot of the work that I, a lot of my work, I got to pay somebody else to help me with. I've invested, I don't even want to think about how much money I've invested into my work. But what I do to survive is very, very different. And so a lot of that has to do with, for us, what do, how do we make money? What is our relationship to money? Are, are we greedy towards money? Are we aversive towards money? Do we not want to think about money? And so we have, I think it's very helpful to make these clear distinctions that work and serve. I like, I, I think action and livelihood doesn't do a lot of heavy lifting for me in terms of being enthusiastic about this, but work and survival really does. And now I have the also the unique privilege of like my work and survival are kind of intermingled because I'm actually kind of at work right now. I mean, I, I work as a Dharma teacher, which other than being a musician, I, I always jokingly say I made two terrible career choices. I tried to be, be a musician. And when that didn't pan out, I became a Dharma teacher. It's like, Jesus, I should have listened to my fucking mom, you know? 
<laughs> but I, I actually love everything I do. I'm mostly kidding, but part of it is like, you know, and some of us are very lucky and very fortunate that our work and our survival have an overlap, but some of us, not so much, a lot of people, not so much. Right. I think the goal is to have some overlap and the hard, the hardest part about all this is that we actually have to work. We have to learn how to, to, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. Because a lot of times as we go through our day, we have to survive and we have to do our work. We have to be doing them simultaneously. You know, I do a bunch of stuff for my Dharma teacher work career that I don't like to do. Like I do lots of emailing and lots of scheduling. I, I don't have a staff. I don't have one. I mean, I do everything. I update my website. I do my emails. I, I do so much shit that I'm not interested in doing whatsoever. For me, that's the survival side. I'm like, if I'm going to make this thing work, I have to do all this stuff. Right. But I, and I have to meet with a student after that. So a lot of times we find that we have to, you know, like, and so we owe it to ourselves to do our work. Like some people might be an artist or a painter, you know, they don't, you know, I know many artists who don't make any money off there, but they do it anyway. Part of their work is they're artists. But what they have to do is they have to go grind it out at this eight hour a week job that they totally fucking hate. So that way they can paint on the, it's like, we, and that's, that's, a, that's a Duca thing. That's like, we have to do that. You know, and so a lot of it is like understanding, like for me, when I, when I am doing my survival business and with a lot of aversion and frustration, I say, I'm doing this so I can actually do this other thing. And so I think that you really have to, and I'll unpack this exhaustively as is my style, but uh, next week and the week after, so we can really kind of get a sense. And really, it, as, as the title of the, the sessions are, is having a broader perspective on these path factors, having a secular perspective, because you're a secular person living in a secular world, whether you like it or not. And so, you know, we're non-monastics and, um, it's not anti again, it's just a matter of, we have to embody and, and deal with the conditions that we are in, our social, our financial, our racial, our sexual, all of these things are part of our practice. Um, and this is, you know, this, this was the inspiration behind the Secular Dharma Foundation. Um, and so, you know, again, also too, I think there's a link in there. I know there's only a few around here, but I do am doing this program. You can check it out next year, which is gonna be um, an in-person, program. It's a 15 month program. There's three residential retreats. It's actually in Big Bear. So it's not that far away from you. There's three residential retreats. Uh, there's a whole online curriculum. Uh, there's guest teachers, there's we monthly sessions, you you can look at the email if you like, if you have any other questions, you can let me know. Um, it's almost full. Um, so we have a couple more spots left. But for those of you who want to do a little bit more of a deep dive and kind of, you know, look at this stuff from a little bit different perspective. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about it because it's, and mostly I say all this because this is what I've been doing. Um, and so I, I tried so hard to, to just pound it out inside the Buddhist box, but I wasn't able to do that. I needed to reach outside. Um, so anyway, we're about at time. So I want to thank you very much for joining me uh, and for recording and, and feel happy to share this recording wherever and however you like. <laughs>